Hello and welcome to Western Roman History. On the 15th of August, 423, the Emperor Honorius died. His reign had witnessed a period of invasion and crises that nearly extinguished the Western Roman Empire with foreign invaders and internal rebellion tearing it apart. However, Constantius III and Honorius had recovered the situation, and all of the major threats – the Visigoths, the Alans, the Subi, the Vandals, and the Usurpers – had been defeated and subjugated. However, matters still rested on a knife edge. Honorius, having no children of his own, tried to continue the Theodosian dynasty by having his sister marry the general Constantius, who Honorius appointed as co-emperor in AD 421. The couple had a son, Valentinian, who became the heir of Honorius, after Constantius. However, Constantius III died from sickness. His wife, Galla Placidia, fell out with her brother Honorius, and she fled with Valentinian to the Eastern Roman Empire. Valentinian was not recognised as Honorius's heir by either Honorius nor his nephew, Theodosius II, but the animosity that had been growing between the two emperors dissipated as a result of this tragic affair. Once Honorius was dead, from August to November 423, Theodosius II became sole emperor of both halves of the Roman Empire. He had no intention of making a new Western emperor. The bishop Hydatius wrote in his chronicle, 41st in line of the Roman emperors, Theodosius, the son of Arcadius, who had been reigning in the east for a number of years after the death of his father, ruled the empire alone at the age of 22, following the death of his uncle Honorius. The church history of Socrates, a contemporary source from the east, gives further details. When the emperor Honorius died, Theodosius, now sole ruler, having received the news concealed the truth as long as possible, misleading the people sometimes with one report, and then with another. But he privately dispatched a military force to Salona, a city of Dalmatia, that in the event of any revolutionary movement in the west, there might be resources at hand to check it, and after making these provisional arrangements, he at length openly announced his uncle's death. It is in this situation that Primicarius Notariorum Ioannes, or John in English, on the 20th of November, AD 423, proclaimed himself Emperor of the West at the city of Rome. During the proclamation, someone shouted, He falls, he does not stand. But the crowd retorted, He stands, he does not fall. John has sometimes been seen as a puppet of the Magister Militum Castinus. This comes from the chronicle of Prosper Tyro, who wrote, Honorius died, and John took his imperial authority. It was thought that Castinus, who commanded the army as master of the soldiers, pretended to look the other way. Castinus was then consul for AD 424. However, if Castinus truly sought imperial ambition, and just used John, why should he not proclaim himself as emperor? It seems an overinterpretation of events by historians. Occam's razor suggests an alternative interpretation implying that it was John himself who had the impetus for proclaiming himself emperor. He was his own agent and not the puppet of a generalissimo. The more substantial sources of Socrates, Olympiodorus, and Philostorgius place John at the centre of the revolt, not Castinus. Castinus's endorsement was important because he was Magister Militum and Commander-in-Chief of the army. John, being a civil servant, would need the backing of the army to successfully become emperor, and likely promised Castinus with the consulship to look the other way and pave his way to the throne. Many questions appear as to why the West proclaimed its own emperor three months after the death of Honorius. Secondly, why John in particular, and why at Rome? The sources give no explicit reason for the revolt. Some educated guesses can be made. However, we can never know for certain. If we place Socrates' passage during Theodosius II's sole rule, 
then his actions could have been interpreted as an act of aggression by the West and been a motivation for John to become emperor. Wichnendale has spotted another more concrete reason for the proclamation of John as emperor, the existing rivalry between Castinus, the Magister Militum and Boniface, comes Africae. In AD 422, Castinus and Boniface had led an expedition to Spain that ended in defeat and a falling out between the two generals. Boniface then moved to Africa and became its governor. He had also pushed to have Gala Placidia restored after her exile. Wichnendale pointed out the significance of when John became emperor and where. The 20th of November was when the sailing season in the Mediterranean Sea came to an end, and travel would be very perilous. It is possible, but not proven, that Boniface threatened to cancel the grain shipments to Rome, to force the West to bring back Gala Placidia. What is proven is that Africa was important in John's rise to power, because he sent troops to wrest the province from Boniface, even with war with the East looming. Secondly, why John? Since he was a fairly high-ranking administrator, as Primicarius Notariorum, he presumably possessed enough skill and initiative to be recognised as emperor by the Senate and army in Italy. Procopius also says of him that he was both gentle and well endowed with sagacity, and thoroughly capable of valorous deeds, indicating that he had an attractive personality and one that was remembered over a century after his death. Italy, Spain, Gaul, and Illyricum recognised John as Western Emperor. John minted coins with Victoria Org, the second AG, suggesting he publicised his recognition of Theodosius II, and thus wanted to become his partner in empire. The third G might be Eudokia Augusta, or Gala Placidia. Whilst in Rome, John celebrated the Praetorian Games, hosted by Probus Anicius, with Olympia Dorus making an extensive report. Many of the Roman households received an income of £4,000 of gold per year from their properties, not including grain, wine and other produce which, if sold, would have amounted to one-third of the income in gold. The income of the households at Rome of the second class was 1,000 or 1,500 pounds of gold. When Probus, the son of Alibrius, celebrated his praetorship during the reign of the usurper John, he spent 1,200 pounds of gold. Before the capture of Rome, Symmachus the orator, a senator of middling wealth, spent £2,000 when his son Symmachus celebrated his praetorship. Maximus, one of the wealthy men, spent £4,000 on his son's praetorship. The praetors celebrated their festivals for seven days. Then, John moved from Rome to the capital, Ravenna. At some point during John's reign, he retired many generals from their command which caused enmity amongst these retired generals and elements of the army, which was later exploited to bring about his downfall. John introduced a law that forced all clerics to submit legal cases to secular courts. The Sir Midonian constitutions include a revocation of John's law. It also restored some privileges from some churches and bishops appointed by the Theodosian dynasty were to be restored, implying that John had made some ecclesiastical changes. Although John was Emperor of the West, his control was not accepted everywhere. Count Boniface, the governor of Africa, loyal only to himself and the Empress Gala Placidia, remained at odds. The Western Empire's most important province was not under John's control. In 424, presumably when the sailing season resumed, John sent his army in Italy to wrest the province of Africa from Boniface, but it failed. Prospetiro noted how this expedition significantly weakened John's defences against the Eastern Roman armies. After Africa, the second most important province of the Western Roman Empire was Gaul, because it provided many soldiers, but was a breeding ground for political and military unrest. John appointed a new Praetorian prefect of Gaul called Exuperantius of Poitiers. The soldiers mutinied 
and murdered Exoperantius in the prefectural capital of Arles. John did not enact any repercussions against the mutineers. Above all else, John had to be recognised as emperor by the Eastern Emperor Theodosius II to approve his illegal assumption of the throne. Philostorgius reported that John seized the throne and sent an embassy to Theodosius. The embassy failed and the envoys were treated harshly and exiled to various places along the Propontis. Socrates adds, John sent an embassy to the Emperor Theodosius, requesting that he might be recognised as his colleague in the empire, but that prince first caused the ambassadors to be arrested. Afterwards, Theodosius II sent a letter to John threatening him with military force. On the 23rd of October, AD 424, a campaign against John was organised, led by the Magister Militum, Ardaba the Elder. John, upon hearing that his envoys had been arrested, summoned Aetius, the Cura Palati, a tribune in the Imperial Guard, and gave him a large sum of gold to buy Hunnish military support. Aetius, having been a hostage of the Huns, made many friends amongst them, and was perfect for the role. John's strategy was to let the Eastern Romans come to Italy and then pincer their army with Aetius and the Huns attacking the rear and John and his Western Romans attacking the front. The Eastern Roman army, led by Ardaba, Aspar and Candidianus, marched to Thessalonica and then to Salona, which they captured. Valentinian and his mother moved to Thessalonica and was crowned Caesar by Theodosius II. The cause of the army was to restore the son of Constantius III and Gala Placidia to the Western throne. Operations did not continue until the following year. In the spring of AD 425, the cavalry, led by Aspar, were to march overland to Aquileia, while Ardaba went by sea. During the journey, Ardaba was blown off course, and two of his ships were captured by the forces of John. Meanwhile, Aspar captured the city of Aquileia, John hoped to use his prisoner as a bargaining chip to negotiate peace with Theodosius. He treated Ardaba very well and was given an element of parole. Ardaba exploited John's generosity to send messages to his son, ordering him to march on Ravenna. Ardaba also swayed the retired generals to his side. Candidianus continued his campaign against northern Italy and captured many cities for the east. Aspar and the cavalry sped towards Ravenna, and, with the help of a local shepherd, navigated through the marshes around the city. Through treachery, the city gates were open, and then ensued a fierce struggle between John's loyalists and Aspar's cavalry. John was taken prisoner and sent to Aquileia. In the city's hippodrome, John had one of his hands cut off, the same punishment Priscus Attalus had suffered and was paraded around on an ass. After a period of abuse, John was decapitated. Theodosius II had triumphed, and upon hearing the news of his general's victory, he halted the games in the Hippodrome of Constantinople to proceed from there with the spectators to spend the day in prayer in Hagia Sophia. He then travelled to Thessalonica to crown Valentinian III Augustus himself, but had to turn back due to an illness. Castanus was sent into exile because, without his help, John would not have been able to become emperor in the first place. Three days later, after John's death, Aetius arrived with a force of some 60,000 Huns. He led his troops against the Eastern Roman army, led by Aspar, in a colossal battle which resulted in heavy casualties on both sides. Gala Placidia, and Valentinian agreed to offer Aetius the rank of comms. They also gave Aetius's Huns money to leave Roman territory, which they did with the help of Aetius. On the 23rd of October 425, Valentinian III was crowned Augustus in Rome by the consent of Theodosius II. The reign of John, though short, was greatly significant. His reign witnessed the reduction of the Western Roman Empire to the position of the junior partner of the Eastern Roman Empire. Rather than equals, Valentinian III and his successors were emperors by the will of the emperor in Constantinople. In the 6th century, chronicles would record several subsequent emperors as Caesar, junior emperor. The same title, Theodosius II, 
initially gave Valentinian III. In effect, Theodosius II had achieved what no other emperor had, the conquest and subordination of the Western Roman Empire. This triumph was where Socrates, Philostorgius, and Olympiodorus chose to end their histories. The reign of John itself shows that he enjoyed considerable support, and, though he made many of the correct moves, many of these efforts failed, such as the reconquest of Africa or getting Theodosius II to accept him as emperor. Yet it required the full might of the Eastern Roman army and navy, as well as treachery, considerable resources, and Theodosius II's abandonment of his plans to reign as sole emperor to subdue John. The historian Procopius remarked about John's brief reign, saying, At any rate, he held the tyranny for five years and governed with moderation, neither giving ear to slanderers, nor committing any unjust murder, not willingly at least, nor did he set his hand to robbing men of money. But he did not prove able to do anything at all against the barbarians, as his relations with Byzantium were hostile. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much to my generous patrons, and this has been Western Roman History.